performance agencies like BMI and uh, ASCAP and all that sort of stuff. So they made, you know, they made a regulation that a news program can use two minutes of music without having to get into all the legalities of it. Uh -huh. Well, I think um, what I might do with this story, kind of expand it to, with you as sort of the focal point, mm -hmm. and do a sort of on the blues revival in yeah. this area, and this, this club, this club has a real interesting yeah, history, yeah. it used to be speakeasy, I'm told, yeah. the man here knows. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. So, uh, it does, you know, they get a lot of people here, a lot of people. So we'll see, we'll see. A lot of stuff we've been talking about I like to touch on when we get going here. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Okay. How you doing, Steve? Okay, I just want to hear. Yeah, we'll talk you, back for one question. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, just fine, just fine. <laughs> a little hot, a little hot and humid. You ever get back to Mississippi very often? Yeah, now and then. Yeah, I, I have a brother there and his family, and my mother's still there. Yeah. Okay. I get down now and then. You write. Rolling. You write your lyrics first, right? Yeah. How come? Well, uh, I quit uh, writing instrumental music because I got to the point where I preferred the imp improvising. So for the instrumental portions, uh, what I do is just use a structure, a, a progression a structure, and then improvise over that structure. So I don't try to, I don't, I'm not much interested in trying to write instrumental music anymore, partly because I think it's uh, the, all the relations have been exhausted. I mean, you know, every, you know, they, they say that there's no uh, original melodies left. You know, every melody has already been written, which is probably true. <laughs> and uh, so I don't bother trying to find a new melody. So I, I just uh, improvise over a structure, a loose structure. As far as the vocals and the written uh, the words go, uh, I start out with an idea, a phrase, something that uh, uh, hits me and, uh, and has meanings, has different meanings, usually. Well, most of your stuff's uh, kind of, well, stuff I've heard here, hmm. kind of funny. Yeah, a lot of it. There's a lot of humor in it. You know, I get I get accused of cynicism a, a lot, but I don't consider myself a cynic at all because, as I say, it's mostly uh, I consider myself more of a deadpan comedian <laughs> because most of it is humorous. You know, if you know if you know how to, where to laugh. <laughs> if you can get the humor. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> how have you seen the audiences change? You've been at this for 35 years. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, when I started out, I started out playing in honky tonks and, and lounges and uh, road houses in the South, you know, and all over. And I was just playing dance music then. I had to play dance music, you know, that's the only thing you could get a job doing. And uh, because I'm a self taught player, even though I had elementary lessons, but I'm, I, I don't read music very well, so I'm primarily self taught. And I couldn't work things where you had to read big sheets of music and all that. So I, I ended up working uh, joints and playing dance music for the most part, and uh, but always playing some jazz and playing bounces, sort of a swing, rhythm and blues type of dance music, you know, that's how I started out. So when I went to New York, then I got work with some jazz bands, you know, some uh, Stan Getz and Al Cohen, Zoop Sim and so forth, Jerry Mulligan, a lot of so I worked with a lot of jazz groups for my first first few years I was in New York. Things have really changed though since the days of the big clubs, right? Oh yeah, in the late 50s was the jazz boom. And the jazz boom years when it started about 56 or something, 55, and they went through the, the end of the 60s there. And then the rock and roll thing, the English rock and rollers and everything started coming in in the early 60s. and uh, So the whole thing changed, all the jazz clubs slowly collapsed <laughs> around the country most places. You know. For instance, in San Francisco in the 60s, there were like four or five real good music rooms. And now there's one, uh, maybe two, that's part-time or something. What's and, that made you do? Well, it means I've had to travel a lot more. I have to play clubs that are more, uh, not strictly jazz clubs, clubs that have a little bit of everything, you know, a variety of music. There's a lot of those clubs around, and so I work those, and it just means I have to travel more, and the engagements are usually shorter term, whereas in the, in the jazz clubs in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, you'd work two weeks, one week or two weeks, 
twice a year, you know, in, in big cities that had jazz clubs. How often are you on the road? Probably two thirds to three fourths of the year. Tell me about May. Like oh, in May I did 24 one nighters, and, and that was a little bit much actually. So it it's began to get to me. Yeah. Are you? Let me. See, what's a nice white guy with a degree in English <laughs> doing in a career yeah. like this? Yeah, well, that, that, I get that all the time. I couldn't do. Couldn't find anything else to do. I guess. Yeah. Uh, somebody had to do it. <laughs> Did you used to get a lot of flack about being white and doing this? Well, uh, as I said earlier, you know, when I first started doing it, first got to New York, there was a lot of mixed reaction about it, you know. There was uh, some people who were fairly contemptuous and uh, others who were supportive. And it took a long time to <laughs> sort of get it weeded out. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you lived the blues? Well, I mean, I think everybody lives the blues whether they know it or not. <laughs> the blues to me is survival music, you know. And that's what it was in the South for Afro-American musicians. It was, uh, it was a way of surviving a bad situation and, uh, in, a, in a situation in which you have no control over the forces that are coming in on you. And uh, I, nowadays, I think we're all in that shape, you know. <laughs> So uh, I consider it as being universal survival music now. What do you try to say with your music? I don't have no idea. <laughs> you want me to tell you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll leave that up to I'll leave that up to the interpreters. You know, I'm I, I'm I'm trying to get at the truth. That's the main thing. I and mean, I'm trying to, but I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm trying to tell it in a way that. Uh, uh, that uh, utilizes my background in jazz and blues and all that. And the, I'm using the blues as my basic orientation. And I, I put, I've thrown a lot of stuff in on top of that since, since starting out with the blues thing. So I'm just using the, the genre uh, to try to get at some basic truths and, uh, about myself. And, and if I can do that, then there'll be tr truths about other people as well. How do you get yourself psyched up to go up there every night? Well, at this point, I don't try to psych myself up. I just get up and just try to get uh, focused on the music. That's the main thing. Getting uh, set and uh, just trying to get it going. You know, just trying to. It's like every night you start out, uh, start you start over every night. And you ever get up there some nights and say, "Oh, this isn't doing it." Oh, sure, plenty of times. You know, like uh, the whole challenge is to. It's to have a good night, you know, and then some, sometimes you feel like Superman and other times you feel like a displaced person. <laughs> you feel like you're in the wrong place, you know, you wish you were somewhere else. <laughs> and But the funny thing about it is you never know how you sound. And I, from recordings, I've learned that sometimes when I was feeling great and thought I was really sounded good, I didn't like what the recording when I heard it later. And, and then there were a couple of times when I felt miserable and was just scuffling and it sounded good to me later. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah. it's a subjective thing. How would you describe the scene here in South Florida? I saw mostly white folks in here tonight. What, what's the oh, yeah, well, well, you know. Think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. I gotta change yeah. the batteries. Change I'm going to go off you, Steve. Okay? Okay. Okay, we're cooking again. What do you see the scene as your audience here in South Florida? Well, you know, I have. I have similar audiences everywhere, you know. I, I have a pretty good uh, cross section. I have some old oldies that have been with me, have, that have been listening to me for 25 years or so or something. And then there's always a few people from the 60s that heard me in college. And then there's always some younger ones that heard me through, uh, heard my yeah. songs done by their idol, the rockers, you know. A lot of the rockers have used uh, my material. Do you have any regrets? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I haven't had time to think about that. Oh, no, you know, everybody has some regrets, but I don't have anything that like really bugs me. I don't think. <laughs> is it a, is it a hard life? Not, are you kidding? Not, you know, I grew up in Mississippi in the Depression, man. <laughs> you, that you was know. hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, you know. People talk about how hard it is on the road. I always say, yeah, man, it's really terrible, you know. You have, 
you have to live in hotels and they're like people have to come in and clean up the room and you don't get to take out the garbage or anything, you know. <laughs> Sounds it's rough. It's really rough. <laughs> You have to eat in restaurants, you know, you don't, and you don't get to wash the dishes, you know. All the time. <laughs> I know, man, I mean, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell some young musician who's aspiring to do what you've done? Well, the, the classic answer to that is, uh, if you have to ask somebody whether you should do it or not, you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Good answer. How long are you going to keep doing this? As long as I'm physically able, uh, I suppose. Now you do, how do you, you work out, what do you do during the Oh, day? I, I try to stay in shape as well as I can. I try to run a couple, two or three days a week if possible and swim whenever I can and, uh, and do, you know, a little, a little bit of uh, oriental exercise and things, not much, you know, just, I'm not really expert at any of that, but I, just a little bit of everything, just try to get yourself centered and uh, try to get your body worked out and you know, try to eat right and all. Is it hard on a, on a marriage? Well, I don't know. You have to ask my wife. <laughs> now, you know, I've been married 35 years, and I know a lot of engineers and doctors that haven't been married that didn't last. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody married 35 years. Well, um, do you see any sort of blues revival? Do you see What do you see in the future here? Well, you know, the blues, I think, is universal music, and it's always on the... It, it influences everything. You know, like, the blues started to influence in classical music, like George Gershwin, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago, whatever it was, uh, you know, when Louis Armstrong started out in the 20s, you know, and, and when he... Uh, in 1927, Probably the most popular song in the country was My Blue Heaven. Just Molly and Me and Baby Mix, Mix Three. three. Yeah. My Blue Heaven. Yeah, right. Heaven. So that was about the year that Louis Armstrong came along and said, I'm with you, sweet mama, as long as you got the bucks. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> changed the, everything. Right. Huh? And the way he phrased that and the rhythm and, you know, and everything, that, that was the beginning right there. And like that kind of music has become universal. I mean, you go to Bangkok, you go in the hotel lounge and you'll hear guys up there playing music that came from those influences you know you making a comfortable living oh yeah I'm doing okay you know I can't complain like I say you know I was I was uh, raised in the depression in Mississippi <laughs> anything is you know and uh, I work you know I have to work hard for it I have to travel and play a lot but I enjoy playing and so you know I have no complaints when you were growing up did you want to be a musician yeah, I always wanted to be a musician. I, there were uh, times when I didn't expect to be a musician. I, I, it just didn't occur to me that I could make a living doing it. And then, uh, so right after I graduated from college, I got a job in a nightclub in Mississippi, and uh, that, that I've been doing it ever since. Yeah. What's the first song you ever wrote? The first song I ever wrote was called The 14-Day Palmolive Plan. I wrote that when I was in the eighth grade, and it was... Uh, it was about radio commercials at the time. You know, there was radio commercials about palm olive soap. <laughs> Want to give me a couple bars? Sure. You know, like, uh, this. the idea is, you know, that it's so irritating to have to listen to that stuff on the radio. I, you know, but anyhow, that was my hit in grade school. I had a hit, you know, I used to play it at parties and things. Give me a little bit. Uh, let's see, what is it? Oh, you know, I woke up this morning feeling low, thought I'd turn on my radio, that kind of thing. But I tell you, man, it drags me so when they talk about life, boy, stopping B.O. or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question for you. I know you got to get going. You, but you're, it's very difficult for people to describe you, your style. How do you describe it? I don't. You know, I'll leave that up to other people. I, it's, it's a mixture of things, you know. Uh, I'm not a blues revivalist. I don't try to copy the old blues singers or anything like that. I'm not, uh, and I'm not, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to uh, uh, to label it, you know, and uh, in relation to the way things are going, but uh, I don't consider it to be that complex or exotic or anything. You know, I, I think it's mostly, most, mostly what I play is danceable. It's like rhythm, rhythm music, you know, rhythm and blues type thing with, with some other uh, alterations thrown in from uh, uh, contemporary uh, classical composers and contemporary jazz and everything. 
I heard little like Bartok type stuff. Oh yeah, there. I listen to Bartok a lot. I like Charles Eyes and I like Paul Hindemith. All of them. Where does it come from? The gut, well, the brain, just who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I never know that some night I might get up there and just be completely blank. <laughs> Sit there, what, what, what is this? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Who knows? You know, but you know, you, you get a, a repertoire. I built up a repertoire over the years, and that you start out with what you know, and you try to get into something you didn't uh, prepare. You know, something. That, just wing it. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very it. much. Yeah,